He starts down the stairs, holding the railing on his right. He believes he's about to take the correct subway train, even though it's been many years since he's gone underground. He got used to taking buses. He likes to think of taking the subway as going underground. Of course he's right. Some of these trains actually rode above ground and provided much better scenery. The rumble of the rushing train races to meet him, hurrying as he is. Everyone's hurrying. As he reaches the platform, the train doors start to close. He moves toward it, hoping for a second chance. The doors jerk open a bit, then suddenly slam closed before he can get in. He feels momentary disappointment walking away, and the doors open again. He misses the opportunity a second time and sees the train pull quickly away from the station. Finally he gets on the next train. It's not hard to hear what his fellow passengers say because they are all quite close together. And it's equally easy to imagine what they might be saying or thinking to themselves. A seat suddenly becomes available and he succeeds in capturing it squeezed between two people. The man on the left of him pushed quite close is talking to another man, his friend. He's surprised to hear this conversation. He expected cliches and likes the difference. After all, he doesn't count on getting literature on the subway. Fictions and gossip are the rule, and now apparently a worthwhile thought sometimes emerges. In the background there's the constant rumble of the trains cruising along, coming to an abrupt stop, doors parting rapidly, as if they were the welcoming arms of a mother for her child or a missed lover. And just as abruptly the doors slam closed, hesitate, open again briefly, and then finalize their purpose. The cast changes at every station. Two young women standing above him start talking, actually probably continuing a conversation started on the train platform. It seems her boyfriend is not quite what she supposed he was. What's the problem, her friend says. He's always looking at other women. Yes, her friend says, men seem to always be studying the field. He thinks to himself, I do that too. I find my eyes constantly scanning the field, and if there's an interesting woman in sight, I enjoy seeing her, feeling her presence, her energy. This is all based on the visual experience in his imagination. Then he's reminded how much he loves his wife. A new batch of riders enters the car. Positions are reshuffled. Quietly he takes out his small sketchbook and pen, trying not to be noticed. Of course, resisting eye contact is a well-practiced skill for subway riders. He finds he is drawn to the great variety of riders, many different ethnicities, colors, languages, and of course the shapes of their bodies and clothes. The clothing styles are vast, though they all tend to be dark. There's a heavy man slouching, seemingly asleep. He wonders if he's dreaming. He himself dreams a good deal more than he would like to. It feels like going to three feature films each night, and it's exhausting. The heavy man is probably dreaming about getting home and eating. He seems to be a person who really enjoys eating, but maybe he's more complicated than that. He recognizes his own tendency to categorize people or cataloging them, superficially based on their visual, physical appearance. Since he's an artist, he rationalizes that it's okay to do that, even though he knows how wrong he can be. The old woman, clutching her shopping bag, sits as though she is somewhere else, thinking of her grandchildren or her past life. Maybe she's too tired to entertain such philosophical excursions, but then that's his assumption. He has no way, except now and then, to pick up snatches of conversations. 
His mind tends to fantasize, creating their stories. Most of the riders look tired. The train brings the riders into the city early in the day and then returns them, frequently to their neighborhoods in the boroughs. Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, where living is less costly. The city is rich in people, buildings, massive, spectacular architecture, cuisines of every persuasion, and of course a great mix of different peoples. Meanwhile he secretly sketches. The trick is to be invisible, eyes averted, peeking. Of course most of the riders are indifferent to what's going on around them. They're thinking about something else or barely awake. His hands move effortlessly across the page. The riders stimulate his eyes and hands. He needn't think too much about what he's doing, letting his body and hands do the work. Speed's important in case his unaware models move. Not everyone is asleep. Luckily, the pen is very responsive. It glides over the surface of a small pad. He wants the essence even more than the details, the energy of the person, whatever it is. It's mixed with his own energy. Energy is what it's all about. A young woman enters, eyes turned toward her, a rare occurrence. Magnetism, soon followed by a young man. His clothing moves with him, no slack, and one can sense the muscles underneath the sheath of clothing. He looks like he does physical work, or is an exercise freak, keeping his body fit. She's very dramatic looking, also very athletic. Her skin color is tan, and she has a broad face with well-defined cheekbones, eyes dark and hair flowing all around her. The two of them are an energy packet in the environment. Of course by now we are all packed in tight. The people sitting next to him have changed almost with every train stop and no one is paying much attention, luckily, to what he's doing. This makes him feel good, professional. Then the young woman sees that he's eyeing her, more than that, drawing her and her friend. She looks at him. He begins to worry that she may tell her boyfriend, and he might not like it. He's very involved with the drawing he's making. He's picked up some of their energy. He makes believe he's moved on to another subject so as not to arouse suspicion looking in another direction, turning his page, starting a new drawing. There's no hiding what he's been doing. He can see that she's getting closer to her friend, and at the same time, looking his way. He begins to feel warmer, much warmer. She not only gives him, the secret artist, a big knowing smile, but her eyes enlarge. Not to her boyfriend, but to him. He starts to get up, to change his seat, prepared if necessary to get off the subway at the next stop, rushing to put his sketchbook in his pocket. Is she saying anything to her friend? And if so, does he mind? Rather than wait to find out, he pushes his way through the surrounding crowd, excuse me, excuse me, and quickly exits just before the doors close. He's relieved to be back on the subway platform. Here's the door slam closed for good, and the train pulling away. Quickly taking out his pad, he starts another drawing, standing on the platform. There are more models here. The guy leaning up against the steel girder looks interesting. The girders do a job, and look good, declaring the station stop. All this takes him back fifty years when he did exactly the same thing at the Union Square station in New York City, drawing on and in the subway, every time he took a train. The feeling is wonderful, recapturing both that time and place, and the joy of looking, seeing, drawing underground, drawing the energy from the underground and its patrons. If you'd like to see the original drawings from the 1950s, they can be seen at the old print shop in New York City at 150 Lexington Avenue at 30th Street.